Alright boys and girls, we're going to try a little bit different video setting today. Uh, we're going to watch the lecture while I lecture on the lecture. And make sure if you haven't watched this one, watch the other video too so you can compare them, see which ones you like better. Remember it is a video so you do have the ability to pause, rewind, stop, take notes, turn the volume up and down, put on headphones, any of the things you need to do. So today, we're going to talk about uh, water. <clears throat> kind of fun, we've been talking about it really all year anyway. Uh, but mostly, we're going to focus on today how it affects the atmospheric stability, which is a pretty important concept as far as uh, you know weather goes. So, technology, awesome. All right, so let's talk water vapor. Uh, water vapor is actually one of the very most powerful greenhouse gases. It's extremely abundant in the atmosphere. Uh, it absorbs a lot of heat as well. In addition to that, it also emits a lot of heat. So it actually absorbs the heat off the ground, re-emits it back at the earth, all the things that we've been focusing on before. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's not a whole lot of it, which is good because it is a greenhouse gas. It accounts for uh, under 4% of the atmosphere on any given time. It is also the source of all precipitation. That's right, I'll say it again. All the precipitation on the planet comes from water vapor in the atmosphere, which is kind of fun. Now, in addition to that, uh, it also tends to make the atmosphere do all kinds of crazy and different things. So there's our extra point, that way I know it's the next slide. So there's a couple different ways that we measure water vapor. We do it with uh, absolute humidity. Now what's fun about absolute humidity is just how much water vapor is in the air. You usually think of it as a percentage. Usually that number comes in the measurement of grams per meter cubed. Remember a meter cubed is an area of space. So we look at how many grams of water are in it. The relative humidity, that's the one that we actually use, that's the one that is a percentage, and it's dependent on the temperature. That's the really important part, it's dependent on the temperature. So depending on what the temperature is, that's going to affect the solubility of the gas, and affect how much water can actually be in it. All right, now in addition to that, uh, it is a ratio, that's why I express it as a percentage. What's really fun about water is it comes in that favorite of things, the water cycle. I'm going to cut the lights here so you guys can see uh, the importance, great white balance, that was fun, of the water cycle. There it is, being all water cycling. You guys probably remember this from freshman science and uh, other classes. The important things to focus on here in the water cycle as the shadow looms over the board. Uh, infiltration, that's a source of all the groundwater, very important. Maybe you can't see the green. Uh, surface runoff, that's what's responsible for our rivers and streams, etc. Don't forget about uh, evapotranspiration, that's the evaporation from plants. Very important to have that one in there. Uh, and again, all this ends up going right up into the atmosphere. There may be something here that you may haven't seen before, like sublimation and other stuff like that, etc. So we'll turn the lights back on to the next picture. You don't need to see with that level of detail. Blind yourself, there it is. That was fun. Next. So water, it tends to change form. It's all about that cycle. Uh, remember, uh, these phases, we've got to be able to balance out the 320,000 kilometers, cubic kilometers of water that evaporates off the oceans, as, long as, as well as the 60,000 cubic kilometers that come off the land. And it also, in case you guys are wondering, it takes 248,000 cubic kilometers of water to fill the ocean and it only takes 96,000 cubic kilometers to fill the Earth. This gives you the idea that we are basically essentially evaporating an entire ocean. <laughs> That's right, we are basically evaporating an entire ocean uh, all the time. So uh, water, when it's doing the water things and affecting the weather, it's all about its transformations, phases of matter. Now you probably know uh, these ones, you know, liquid water, turning into a vapor, we call that evaporation. It goes the other way, it's the commonly misunderstood concept of condensation. Remember, when condensation is over, what that means is water from the air, from the atmosphere, has actually turned into a liquid. So for example, if you have a glass of water, 
and it's a glass glass you get that water vapor on the outside where did that come from it actually came from the atmosphere and was deposited onto the glass so again this comes from the atmosphere when it's going through condensation and actually will be deposited on a physical surface as a liquid in addition to that you get all kinds of funness uh, melting we know about melting that's where it goes from solid over to liquid and everyone knows about freezing where it goes from a liquid back to a solid so those are the common ones that everybody knows set them again so if you didn't know them before now you know but there's also some fun ones like sublimation what happens in sublimation is it skips it goes straight from solid all the way down to water vapor. It just skips that whole phase of matter, which is really kind of interesting. Uh, it's where the change in temperature is so quickly that it actually changes all the way over to the farthest phase of matter. It can also be called deposition. That's the opposite, where you go from water vapor in the atmosphere, and it will be deposited as solid uh, ice. What's really fun with the deposition and the sublimation is we're skipping a phase, so we're actually uh, able to conserve energy and transfer it. So sublimation, uh, very commonly seen with dry ice, that's what this is. And if we kill the lights, I'm sure you can actually see right there coming off of it, you can see the sublimation happening. All this right here, that's not smoke, that's not CO2, all right? That's water vapor coming right off of it. In addition to that, you can also have uh, another picture. You can actually see all the water vapor. Again, that's water vapor in the bowl there. You can also see here's deposition. Uh, you know, this happens in the wintertime. It's so cold out, you actually get ice deposited right on your windshield. That is deposition. Now, these changes in matter, get the lights back on so you can see me. The changes in matter, they're all about uh, changes in the uh, phase due to heat transfer. But we always meet this thing called the latent heat, which stands for hidden heat. So if you're graphing the heat content compared to the actual temperature, what's really fun is you can see heat is on the Y. So if we go up on the Y, we're adding more heat, we're adding more energy. The unit for that is going to be calories, by the way. If it's a big C, that's kilocalories like in food. So we're going up, and you can see we're increasing temperature, increasing heat. That makes sense. More heat, give those molecules moving around, get it moving faster, faster, faster. And then we hit this area right here. This is called the latent heat of fusion. And it actually goes uh, across the melting temperature, which is also known as the uh, freezing temperature. It's the melting point. And this is where it goes from solid to liquid. You can see that the temperature stays the same. While we're adding more heat, the temperature stays the same. You're adding more heat, but the water molecules actually don't move any faster. And these areas of latent heat are due to hydrogen bonding. Due to hydrogen bonding. And then you continue on your merry way. You're adding uh, more heat which makes sense that you make more temperature until you reach over here. This is the latent heat of vaporization. When you reach the uh, vapor vaporization point, the boiling point of water, and you have this time where you're adding more heat, you're adding more heat, you're adding more heat, but the temperature of the water is just staying the same. It's staying the same. That's the latent heat. The heat is hidden. Where'd it go? Into smashing hydrogen bonds. Definitely didn't go into making the water get any hotter. So as a result, you get this sort of trapped, stored heat that increases the amount of energy available inside of clouds. Everybody feeling good so far? So here's another one. If you flip it on its side, it makes a little more sense if you graph temperature versus heat on the X. But you can see, again, we add more heat, we add more temperature, and it freezes as far as temperature increase goes at the latent heat of fusion and at the latent heat of vaporization. You can actually see that it is not changing temperature even though we are adding more heat here on the X this time. We're adding more heat but it doesn't change the temperature. As a result, water vapor actually tends to hide the heat. Water vapor actually hides the heat, it traps it, it stores it, and so when you're really hot it actually has the ability to store more heat 
in it. Uh, just to give you an idea why that matters, that's why when it's really humid outside it feels warmer because all that humidity is trapping heat. If you're at 80 to 90 degrees, just to give you a little idea about heat index, 80 to 89, uh, you're looking pretty bad, it gets up to 104, you can get sunstroke, you can have heat cramps. Uh, above that, more sunstroke, more heat cramps, you can even have prolonged exposure give you uh, additional uh, physical fatigue and vomiting and nausea for the rest of the day, even after you stop the activity and hydrate. And then uh, up here, uh, if you're upwards of 130, which I've been in, in Spain, it was like that. It was bad. We actually had one of the runners we thought we were going to have to send her home early uh, because she just was so sick. And it was just from being in too much heat. So that's kind of fun. Uh, give you an idea. Here are the weather-related deaths. For those of you who are like, well, whatever, They're probably stupid, doesn't seem like a big deal. The heat is responsible for the most weather-related deaths every single year. The heat is responsible for the most weather-related deaths every single year. And as a result of all the heat in there, it actually does crazy things to the atmosphere, which we will be talking about later.